Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our second day convening on biochar research and commercialization. We'll let the people trickle into the room and then we'll get started. We see a few more people in the waiting room, so we'll probably start in about one minute, but thank you so much for joining us again today. Just as a reminder, and I'll share this again later, um, you'll be muted and your camera's off for this earlier part of the session. And then later when we get to the question section, you'll be able to uh, activate your audio. All right. Okay, looks like a few more people are making their way in. Good, good, good. Wonderful. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as additional folks start to trickle in, I'm happy to repeat some of the earlier housekeeping things throughout. Um, so thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for our second day of our two-day conversation on biochar research and commercialization. But those of you who might not have been with us yesterday, I'm Dr. Lakeisha Odom with the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, which has had the pleasure of being one of the planners and co-sponsors for this event, along with American Farmland Trust and the National uh, NCAT, the National Center for Appropriate Technology. Um, yesterday, I think we had a really quite rigorous discussion and shortly we will have a summary of that. Um, and then we'll have another great round of presentations and discussion. Next slide, please. Just a reminder for some of our um, housekeeping, we will be, uh, participants will be muted. Please ask any question in the chat and we will continue to monitor the chat. Uh, during the breakout sessions, you'll be divided into smaller groups and be able to introduce yourselves. So, so that you can introduce yourselves now, feel free to add in the chat, uh, your name, location, uh, affiliation, if you would like. We will be recording this main session. The breakout sessions will not be recorded, but anytime that we are in this group together, that will be recorded so that we can share after the event and with folks that couldn't attend the event. And then the speaker bios are going to be made available in a link in the chat in about one minute. Um, so if there's any information around the speaker, you would like additional biographical information that's provided. They will do short introductions, but you may want more bio information. Um, next slide. So this agenda will be somewhat similar to yesterday's, um, but we will have reflections uh, first and then a series of speakers and presentations. And we'll be thinking more around the policies and instruments to develop uh, paralysis based on <laughs> someone's fur baby is very excited about this. I'm excited about it as well. Um, and then we'll break into small groups again, um, similar to yesterday, thinking through what is needed to commercialize fuels co-produced with biochar, for example. Example, those are some of the topics that we'll cover. Um, and so I think we can go ahead and get into the fun part of the day. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Bianca Mobius Clune with American Farmland Trust, who is also a planner of the convening and a co-sponsor, share some reflections from yesterday. We had a lot of discussion yesterday. I don't envy her the task of trying to synthesize this, but I know that she is more than up to it. So I can't wait to hear um, Bianca's impressions from yesterday. Um, Bianca, take it away. Thank you so much, Lakeisha, and thank you so much, everybody who is here again today or who is here for the first time today. Welcome back. I'm so excited for today because for me, yesterday was a fantastic overview of the ag production space that I've been engaged with for a couple of decades now. And so many things that were familiar, I learned new things, I learned new connections, new folks involved, all in a very familiar space. Today, for me, will be a whole new world, learning about the state of biochar and biofuel production technology and how we can bring that space together with the agricultural space. So I'm really excited for that, really looking forward to learning from everybody here today. Um, in reflecting a bit on yesterday, Lakeisha, uh, thanks for the, uh, for the trust there. I, I am sure that I will capture some things and there will be highlights that others may want to bring up or put in the chat. So I'm gonna welcome everybody. If you have highlights from today that are particularly worth noting that maybe folks who weren't there yesterday should know about, uh, please do add them to the chat. I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. Um, but a couple of highlights from me. 
the benefits of biochar are diverse and vast. It is just amazing when we look at the space of benefits that we stand to gain from biochar use, from carbon sequestration to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to yield and resilience improvements to the potential to increase agricultural biodiversity by reintegrating some of these biomass crops for production of uh, biochar and uh, energy, animal health implications, water quality, air quality, and rural development, small business opportunities, even for diverse communities, even I think some of the underserved communities. I think there's a lot of amazing work that we can do with biochar. Question is, how are we going to do that? All of us together, everybody brings expertise, everybody brings perspectives. I think they're all valuable and important. So here we come together on that. We have an amazing network of experts and I'm just so excited about the research gaps and roadmap that was shared yesterday. It really fills the space of what's still needed in the research realm. And that's critically important as we try to understand all of the benefits and the variability across the country and how we can use biochar for those benefits. Some key aspects that were mentioned in terms of research, there really needs to be some standardization around data collection and sharing across agencies, projects, industry, and, and public and private partnerships. We really need data sharing so that we can all make more progress on that together. And we need faster decision support delivery. And so really pulling all that together into a national data set and then creating ways that we can deliver that information in a usable way to producers. That was a key thing that I took away from yesterday. Um, a couple of things that struck me, you know, we are just at the cusp of getting to broader implementation beyond just a few enthusiasts, which is where we've been for a long time. We've made tremendous impact in the research space but we're just getting to the point where we can really broaden out implementation. And that's really exciting. And that's something that I heard over and over from various folks yesterday. There was a lot of discussion on the critical need to scale implementation alongside continued research, right? We need to do both of them together. We need to draw on the critical linkages between research and implementation so that we can adaptively and in a user-friendly way really bring the research to bear on what uh, the average farmer has access to and, and can use. Another key take home, the research roadmap is amazing in that it's a really long term research roadmap, right? And we're talking about 50 to 100 years. Um, but one thing that I heard over and over again is we don't have 50 years, right? The climate change problem is here now. Farmers are dealing with it every day. We need to change now. We need to turn carbon back into solid form right now. So what we really need is a five year plan for achieving general knowledge and scale up of biochar, similar to where no-till and cover crops are at right now, right? Just every, probably pretty much every farmer at least has a concept of what cover crops are, what no-till is, what a crop rotation might entail, that there are farmers that are integrating grazing, right? These are the more commonly understood practices, but you say biochar and a lot of people still don't know what that is, Never mind how to apply it and how they can make use of it. So how do we get there fast? And then the key question of how do we scale, right? How do we, how do we uh, address the, the chicken and egg issue where we don't have enough biochar production for farmers to have access to it? Farmers are interested, um, those that, that know that it's there, but the production's not in place. Often we have to ship biochar from far away or we have to bring a small scale unit that may not be the most efficient to a location where we're trying to do trials. Getting to scale to the point where somebody on 20 acres of vegetables can actually get enough biochar to put it on their 20 acres of vegetables. Most farmers don't have that access right now. So how might we prioritize some pilots where feedstocks and degraded ag land are co-located where we can really make some progress in the space where we can uh, put together some frameworks for how this might be expanded in other locations. And then how might we leverage the many potential benefits? How can we tap into public-private partnerships to scale up? How can we determine the economic feasibility that's currently a barrier? How can we get past just those farmers who can now receive equip payments to get it done? Um, how can we get those folks who don't necessarily qualify for those payments, but can we, can we get them some benefits that are economically all around viable? Um, and so one of the things that was brought up in, in that topic area was the, the 
clear need for biochar certification standards so that there are consistent products for farmers, and also the clear need to have a full life cycle of the production that leads to actually reduced greenhouse gas reductions and enabling carbon credits in this space. Because if we can get farmers the carbon credits for the carbon they're putting in the ground or the, the green, greenhouse gas reductions that they're achieving, um, that's, that's one more layered benefit. So all of those topics, there's a lot to do here. Um, one concern that I heard a number of times was the, the, the real need to build that delivery system so that it remains overall climate neutral or better, right? We are, we are currently shipping biochars from the fuel production facilities to other locations. And that's great for research purposes. That's great for pilot small demonstration trials. Uh, but we need to get to a point where locally everybody has availability. And so how do we do that? And one last thing, and I'm going to wrap up. Um, the plan for how we implement really needs to be integrated with soil health management systems or regenerative systems or climate smart systems, right? All of these, all these terms are interchangeably used these days. Whichever way you talk about them, we are currently scaling up the use of these systems that, that build multiple, multiple practices into a system that, that works, that leverages the benefits of all of those practices for more high functioning soils, more high functioning agroecosystems for ecosystem service benefits. And we need to pull biochar into that space. We need to use it as a layered benefit for even more economic and on-farm viability for even further decreased risk for all of the benefits that we already get from soil health management systems where those are being adopted. We need to pull bio bioenergy, uh, sorry, biochar into that as a critical component. Um, and so I really look forward to increased discussion today on how it is that we're gonna produce all that biochar and, and where the technology is at, where maybe some of the gaps are so that hopefully we can make progress in that space. With that, I'm sure there are key things that I did not cover that happened yesterday. I would welcome to hear from anybody else on those key points that I may have missed or questions, comments in general. I think this is a really great space for lots of discussion. So looking forward to the discussions today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bianca. I feel like my faith was well placed. You did an excellent summary. And um, I'm sure as the day goes on, we'll continue to come up with new, exciting concepts, ideas, and try to get closer to some of those answers. So I'm very excited to pass um, the next section over to David Laird, President and CEO of Incense and Professor Emeritus of Soil Science at Iowa State University. And for about the next hour and a half, he'll walk us through uh, a series of really exciting conversations and um, hopefully we'll come up with new questions and possibly new answers. So I'll turn everything over to David next. Well, thank you, Lakeisha. And Thank you very much, uh, Bianca, for that excellent summary of um, the research roadmap, uh, research gaps that we discussed yesterday. Um, uh, one of the points you brought up uh, and that I would concur with is, is that we don't have 50 years. We have to do the development of the paralysis industry concurrently with that roadmap. Now, um, we have a goal to address climate change. Uh, we need to remove, I think the number is around a thousand gigatons of carb CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, biochar, therefore, to be a significant player in that needs to be scaled up to at least a gigaton of CO2 per year here in the US and many times that worldwide. Um, back in 2018, the International Biochar Initiative estimated that there were 135 um, biochar production facilities in the US uh, producing 15 to 20,000 tons of uh, biochar per year. It's a niche market, very small and, and not obviously um, anywhere close to where we need to go. Uh, targeting high value uh, applic horticulture, uh, environmental remediation, mine land remediation, um, contaminant 
uh, removal from stormwater and so on. So high value applications. In order to scale to a gigaton here in the US, uh, it is going to be essential that biochar be routinely applied on agricultural land, not just horticultural land. We're going to have to move into um, production agriculture. And, and my, my metric for that is when corn farmers in the Midwest uh, are routinely applying biochar, uh, we're going to be there. And so one of the questions that that I have asked and have considered in, in my research over the last few years was, how do we do that? And um, looking at the economics, the agronomics, and the environmental sustainability for that. Well, today we have um, uh, five speakers. And I'm going to begin uh, by giving you a presentation from my perspective on what it would take to get um, agriculture corn farmers in the Midwest to be routinely using biochar. I'll be followed by Robert Brown, who is a professor of mechanical engineering at Iowa State, and who will um, present the state of the technology for uh, pyrolysis, uh, where it is in terms of commercial readiness. And then with by David Zilberman, who's economist at UC Berkeley, who will talk about uh, you know, opportunities and hurdles, problems associated with um, scaling up the pyrolysis biochar bioenergy industry. And then uh, Dale Smith, who is uh, with the Boeing Corporation Sustainable Aviation Fuels, and he'll give an industry perspective on, <clears throat> on need for renewable fuels. And finally, by uh, Nicole Fitzgerald, who's uh, with uh, the DEO, DOE Office of Bioenergy Technology, and she'll give us a, a, a DOE perspective on how they can help uh, in this uh, scale-up process. So um, let me begin by um, sharing my screen, and I will um, give you uh, my perspective on what it takes to, for an agronomic viability and sustainability of a pyrolysis biochar bioenergy industry. Um, in this slide, uh, I live in Ames, Iowa, and it happens to be seven miles from the DuPont cellulosic ethanol plant, which went bankrupt. But uh, cellulosic ethanol um, <clears throat> gave us a window in the harvest, storage, transport, logistics of corn stover. Uh, we know there are problems. Moving this much stover, uh, there were fires, there's uh, truck problems, there's quality control problems. Nonetheless, uh, farmers and industry stepped up. And, and have a roadmap really already for how to move and handle the kind of biomass that it will take to have a true industry scale of systems. Now, my background is that of a soil scientist, and I'm uh, less concerned about those logistic challenges. I know we can do it. I'm more concerned about the soil that you see in the foreground in this picture. Uh, if we remove that soil, uh, or sorry, we remove that biomass year after year, we're going to cause long-term degradation and, and raise sustainability challenges. And that's where biochar comes in. Um, the phenomenal growth of biochar literature over the last 15 years is, is impressive. Uh, there are now over 22,000 refereed journal publications indexed by the word biochar in the web of science. And across this uh, literature, I think there is broad consensus that biochar is highly effective for sequestering carbon. Half-lives of the char carbon is over 100 years. Plus, it has really good effect on soil quality, soil health, reducing bulk density, increasing porosity, uh, increasing uh, water and nutrient holding capacity, enhancing nutrient cycling. It's a lime, a liming agent. Now, again, across this 22,000 publications, 
there's also a lot of diversity of outcomes. Scientific literature does not, I say consensus, but that there's all kinds of outliers and issues. Those relate overwhelmingly to the incredible diversity of the system we're looking at. We've got many different types of biochars, different types of soils, different types of climates, different types of crops, different types of management systems. And of course, there's going to be positive, negative, neutral outcomes. The challenge then is to be able to synthesize the mechanistic knowledge and the fundamental knowledge through modeling and other decision support tools so that we can give farmers and land managers the opportunity to manage biochar systems in a way uh, that is optimum for their agricultural land. So the knowledge gaps that I've listed here are more practical. Uh, what is the value proposition for a farmer? And up to now, uh, the main challenge has been that ecosystem services are being discounted. Um, <clears throat> there is an emergent uh, bio idea of bringing biochar into the carbon credit market that critically needs to be done. Um, as Bianca mentioned, we need to be able to define biochar quality, have standards, industry standards, ways of um, controlling and regulating and putting the biochar where it will do the optimum good on, on specific farms and under site specific conditions. And of course, more life cycle assessments are needed, not so much at an at a individual uh, farm scale, but across the system. So with that in mind, um, I wanna just look at it for, again, from a corn farmer's perspective in the Midwest. And as I said, there's 22,000 studies. Um, these are just four or three studies that I was personally involved in over the last few years. Um, a shows that we had a 63% increase in soil carbon levels as a consequence of biochar addition 500 days afterwards. This is a small um, uh, soil microcosm, one kilogram of soil scale process. The manure was much less effective in increasing carbon after that length of time. B shows a 45% increase. Now, and this is a long-term field plot study. In purple, we have the baseline soil carbon levels of 2006. In blue, we have the carbon levels of plots that received no biochar in 2016. And in orange, you see uh, the plots that received the biochar addition. There's uh, five different rotations, one of which, number five, is a continuous switchgrass. Uh, it did not have biochar, but you can see the switchgrass was also effective in, in increasing carbon. And C are plots that are on highly eroded land um, in which uh, we've got a lot of diversity, so there's a much bigger standard errors associated with um, with these plots, but nonetheless, we saw a 52% increase in carbon. So that part, I think, is pretty solid. Um, another factor that is really emerging in the literature now is what's called negative priming. This is the concept that when you put biochar on the soil, you can actually increase the saturation point at which the, how much carbon that soil will hold. And we know, understand this intuitively. If you have a sandy soil and a clay soil under identical management and, and climate conditions, the clay soil is going to hold more carbon than the sandy soil. When you put biochar into the system, you increase the capacity of that soil to hold new biogenic carbon. So in this study, and this is aggregated across um, uh, large scale plots, um, uh, in, uh, let's see, six years from 2011, when the plots were established to 2017, um, We've got a continuous no-till corn, we've got a switchgrass, and we've got a um, prairie polyculture with three different um, prairie grasses in it. Um, <clears throat> on the right, you see the overall average in the controls that had no biochar, and there was about a two 
ton per acre, two, sorry, two megagram per hectare increase in carbon content. And on the left, you see uh, the, other, the other half of the split pond that had um, the biochar. And the red is the biochar carbon and the black is new biogenic carbon. In other words, by putting the biochar there, we stimulated the accrual of additional biogenic carbon. Now to try and put this in a um, conceptual way, I think you know, this is sort of a hypothetical model. Think about a soil that is essentially at equilibrium, 2% carbon, uh, not equilibrium, let's call it steady state. There's year-to-year -year fluctuations and so on. If we come in and uh, start removing crop residue from that, we're going to see a loss of soil organic carbon. Uh, and after time, that will approach a new steady state condition. Um, <clears throat> with that loss of carbon, the soil is going to have a higher bulk density, less porosity, less nutrient, less water holding capacity. It will be less resilient system. Conversely, if we uh, apply biochar to that system and retain the crop residue, what we're seeing is that you're going to see an increase in carbon immediately when you put the biochar on because of the carbon that's in the biochar. But after that, after a short transition period, we're going to see an increase in the amount of biogenic carbon, new soil organic carbon that's going to build up over time because you've raised the carbon saturation level of that soil by putting the biochar on. And finally, if we add biochar and remove the crop residue, what we can see is we can get to a, basically a, a sustainable steady state system at a new and higher level. You won't see as much benefit from the accrual of new biogenic carbon, but you won't see the loss of it either because the soil system will be more efficient at utilizing uh, carbon in the roots and what carbon is left on the surface to protect the soil from erosion and so on. So this allows us then the sustainable harvesting of crop residue. I listened to the DOE presentation on Monday and, and Virginia Jen was suggesting that uh, um, their recommendation was that, that farmers in continuous corn harvest only about three tons of residue every other year. And in a corn soybean rotation to take um, three tons every fourth year in that system. What biochar does is to change that paradigm. It means that we could potentially double the amount of residue that could be sustainably harvested. We could take it off that three tons every year on a continuous corn system. Now, let's look at it from, again, from the farmer's perspective. These are long-term, large-scale plots, 0.27 acres. So they were managed with um, farm equipment. Um, and we've got three different levels of crop residue removal, 0, 50, and 90%. And we've got uh, three levels of biochar addition. In blue, the uh, control, uh, red, 4.4 ton per acre, and uh, green, 8.2 tons per acre. Now, the big message that comes out of this data, and you'll notice, is the, the effect of crop residue removal. We saw, a, on average, about a 23% uh, – sorry, 23 bushel per acre yield increase by removing the crop residue. Now, a moment ago, I said that removing crop residue is going to cause a degradation of soil quality. And what we've got here is a, a, a dangerous situation because the farmer is incentivized to remove that residue, sell it, get, prop, get, get income from the selling of the residue. And that's a short-term benefit to the farmer because they'll also get a yield increase in a continuous corn system, but it's at a long-term risk of soil quality and degradation of the soil resource and loss of soil organic carbon. Now, the biochar, the different colors in these, uh, in these graphs, you'll see that at the 50 and 90% residue removal rates, we have no yield increase due to biochar, none. But at the zero residue removal rate, we did see a statistically significant average of about 12 bushel per acre higher yields in the um, uh, 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 
the 8.2 uh, ton per acre biochar treatment. Now, what's going on here? Why is this yield increase occurring? And there's many reasons in a continuous corn system, but the most likely explanation involves something called leopathy. That is, when there's too much residue on the surface, the decomposition of that residue releases phenolic compounds, which are quite frankly toxic to emerging seedlings and therefore inhibit early season growth uh, and germination. And this is why we see a yield loss and uh, with continuous corn relative to corn soybean rotations and why we see a yield gain when we harvest that crop residue. The reason biochar was effective in this situation uh, was because it was absorbing those phenolic compounds and mitigating the allelopathic uh, benefit. So that was the actual complex system here, the way we see a yield increase. Looking at the economics, uh, to do this for this site, uh, we assumed that the farmer applied uh, 10 tons of biochar per acre and took out a 20 year loan, 5% interest uh, to pay for that cost. And uh, if you assume now that the 12 bushel per acre and you assume a four and $5 uh, corn yield increase, five, four or $5 corn price and a 12 bushel per acre yield increase, uh, the most the farmer could pay for that biochar is 50 to $60 per ton, um, which is a non-starter. You're not gonna be able to scale up with that kind of a price. Um, if however we allow, if we however we consider that the farmer was able to harvest three tons per acre of stover, and sell that stover at $40 a ton, plus get the 23 bushel per acre yield increase. Now the price of the biochar is up to 250 to $300 per ton, which is certainly marginal for um, getting, uh, 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 for, for, for purchasing biochar. It's not gonna be profitable, uh, but it, it gets close to a break even point. Um, Back before, in 2007, uh, I bought two semi-loads worth of charcoal. This was before biochar was, was uh, all, uh, a, a, an important issue. And I paid $200 a ton for the char back then. Um, in 2013, um, uh, um, biochar was selling for over $2,000, close to $3,000 a ton. And now it's maybe dropped down to around $1,000 a ton. So there's a price gap between what is realistic and what is possible. The fact that we could, that Missouri charcoal kiln producers could sell it for $200 a ton uh, back in 2007 suggests to me that with scale up that that price can come, back, come down. Now, going from an individual case study to a national scale. This is a map generated by Hansi uh, Dokai. And uh, what he did was to um, <clears throat> do a, a meta-analysis of the literature and combine that with the soil survey data and combine that with climate data to predict the probability of a crop yield increase on a 10 meter square grid on all agricultural land in the US. So if you can't read this, the color, the, the green is the higher probability, 85 to 90%, and the red is the lower probability of a yield increase. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variation uh, here in, Calif in California, the east and west sides of the valley, of the Central Valley, uh, show quite a stark difference. In, in Iowa, where I am, you see we have a lot of reds and yellows, uh, which is consistent with the uh, data that I just showed you for that individual example. Now, working with economists, uh, we took this same data and um, tried to scale it up to figure out what the net present value or the break even cost of the biochar is on a county scale uh, in the Eastern half of the US. And what you're seeing here is uh, that 
some places, particularly like southern Georgia here, it can be almost $500 a ton for corn systems. It's lower than that for soybean and other crops. Uh, in the upper Midwest where I am, you see the price is, is $100 or less, which is consistent with the single case study that I showed you a moment ago. Um, scaling this up, looking across the entire US, uh, we see in this what the cumulative corn area is in millions of hectares versus the net present value of the biochar. And we see that in about 15 million hectares, there can be about a $200 uh, value for that char, um, which again is, is, is a very nominal price. Now, I remind you that there's 150 million hectares of cropland in the US, which means we're talking marginal on 10% of the land. If we wanna scale up to a gigaton, uh, we've got to be able to apply that biochar broadly across almost all agricultural land in the US. So concluding here, uh, I'm going to simply say that biochar is highly effective for sequestering carbon. The biochar applications will allow farmers to harvest a greater fraction of their crop residues sustainably and that crop yield increases, however, are not enough, are not large enough to incentivize application of biochar on most cropping lands. Therefore, in my judgment, it is absolutely essential that we have additional value brought in uh, that recognizes uh, that carbon credits for biochar to help make it profitable, and secondly, to enable the farmers to sell their crop residues uh, for bioenergy biochar production systems. And with that, I thank you. And um, now uh, it's my honor uh, to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Robert Brown. And uh, Dr. Robert Brown is the Arston, uh, Mar Marston Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering and the um, Gary and Donna Hoover Chair of Mechanical Engineering at Iowa State University. And he's one of the leading experts on um, uh, fast pyrolysis technology. And he's going to talk with us today about the current state of commercial readiness of pyrolysis and biochar technologies. Robert? Uh, thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yep. And I hope you're seeing a full screen of my first slide, State and Commercial Readiness of Pyrolysis. I've got a couple of screens here and want to make sure you're seeing the right one. Um, it looks like you're trying to share. I don't see it yet. I see your name. Okay. Let's see what happens. Can you see it? There we go, Robert. Yep. Perfect. Uh, full screen. Very good. I uh, appreciate this opportunity to talk about production issues of biochar. I don't think any of the listeners need too much convincing that uh, biochar has a lot of advantages, uh, but what's it gonna take to actually bring it into commercial readiness? And I'm gonna try to give a partial uh, answer to that. Uh, let's start with uh, looking at uh, what pyrolysis is. And I define it as the thermal decomposition of organic compounds under oxygen starved conditions not necessarily a complete absence of oxygen, as I'll show in a couple of minutes. And I think it's real important to distinguish between slow pyrolysis and fast pyrolysis. Slow pyrolysis, just as it suggests, it may take hours or even days to complete the pyrolysis process. Uh, it is a traditional charcoal making technology. Fast pyrolysis is completed in seconds to just a very few minutes. Uh, this has only been developed in the last 40 years and with the goal of producing more than just uh, biochar. I show a pizza oven here because uh, a really hot pizza oven is a, a, a good representation of the kind of temperatures uh, that we actually will do production of uh, biochar, especially when we're looking at fast pyrolysis. Uh, in terms of products, I think it's really important to recognize that pyrolysis produces more than solid, the biochar. I'm showing here uh, someone uh, producing biochar in their backyard. Uh, their neighbors are probably not too happy about it because they're also producing bio oil. That white smoke is an aerosol 
that if it was condensed is actually a really interesting product that I call bio oil. Uh, so we've got, there are gases that are non-condensable, they're flammable, they could be used for energy generation to help uh, run the pyrolyzer. Uh, the solid, of course, is going to be the biochar, and it's important to know it's more than just carbon, solid carbon. It also has uh, ash components to it, and that is going to be a really important when you talk about, hey, my yields are 20 percent biochar. The next question is, well, how much of that is ash? That is uh, providing less of the uh, kind of ecosystem services that we normally think about. And then finally, the liquid. Uh, it is a mixture of water and organic compounds known as bio oil. Uh, I want to deal a little bit more about the differences between slow pyrolysis and fast pyrolysis. Uh, I do have my prejudices on which way to go in terms of making this an economical uh, process. I'll describe that as we go along. So slow pyrolysis uh, has the advantage. It is very simple technology. A uh, 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 um, middle school student uh, wrote me and said, can I get some biochar from you? And I said, you know, you can produce it yourself pretty, pretty well. Go out and have a campfire, a wiener roast and you can collect the biochar. Now, it's not a very efficient way of doing it, but you can produce it that way. Uh, that means it's going to be low capital cost, and it actually produces relatively large biochar uh, yields. Um, I don't uh, list it here because it's so variable depending on the, the kind of biomass and the conditions under which you conduct slow pyrolysis, but it can be in the range of 20 to 40%. Uh, the challenges are that its only co-product is low BTU gas. Now, that could be used to support your pyrolyzer, but there's not much market for it. And so in some sense, that means the biochar has to stand on its own merits. And, and that, as, as Dave would point out, that could be real challenging. Um, and I am going to say that the economics as a result are uh, less attractive than fast pyrolysis. Uh, this is actually a, a slide that I developed from uh, data presented by uh, David Laird and, and Mark Wright, uh, when they were both at Iowa State University. Uh, this is illustrating the market size, tons per year, okay, versus the biochar value, dollars per ton. Uh, we can see that there are some very high value applications like land reclamation or residential, uh, residential retail. These are the folks that are selling it on eBay for a $1,000 a ton. The consumer doesn't know that's how much they're paying because they're buying such small quantities of it and it's, it's packaged and marketed differently. But when we're going to talk about general agriculture, we are down at that $100 a ton that David referred to. So that is the challenge. Uh, if we're going to be talking about large scale application where we really can have impact on carbon removal and ecosystem services, we are going to have to figure out a way to make biochar economically. And that's where I, I advocate fast pyrolysis as a way to overcome these economic barriers because it produces high value bio oil as well as biochar. Uh, it is suitable for processing uh, distributed sources of biomass. Uh, the technology is more complicated than slow pyrolysis, but it's still a lot simpler than for example, uh, the cellulosic ethanol plants, for example. Uh, and it does have promising economics. The challenge is, is the technology is more complicated than what you do with slow pyrolysis. That means higher capital cost, uh, higher operating cost as well. And it does have less biochar yield. So it's starting to sound like a loser here. But in fact, uh, it is uh, economically has advantages because of this notion of producing products in addition to the, uh, to the uh, biochar, all right? Uh, I put this up here to just show it's, this isn't a slam dunk. There have been efforts to commercialize pyrolysis-based biofuels, and, and they didn't call it fast pyrolysis, but that was really what it was. Uh, you'll see, I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but you'll notice that bankruptcy is on the uh, list of uh, final outcomes of these commercial uh, attempts. Uh, there are some that have made progress, but generally like uh, 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 enzymatic hydrolysis for production of, of uh, ethanol, uh, it has not been uh, particularly successful to date. So we think you need to do even more than get some high value products. You have to make them really high value products and I'm going to say bio oil by itself isn't 
a really high value product, you've got to do a lot of upgrading with it. Uh, there's some uh, parts of it that are not as valuable. And these are things that we're working on uh, to move it towards demonstration and commercialization. And that is to simplify the design and reduce the cost of pyrolysis. Now that's gonna be true of both uh, slow and fast, but it's particularly true for fast pyrolysis. We need to get even higher value products from the pyrolysis of biomass. We're going to uh, make those our profit center and make it uh, commercially feasible to produce the biochar. Uh, we've developed something called autothermal pyrolysis, and it really gets a, away from a lot of the complexity of trying to get heat into a pyrolyzer. It sounds simple. It is if you're building a laboratory scale pyrolyzer. Once you talk, start talking about a commercial scale, it is very difficult to get the heat in that's required to drive the pyrolysis reaction. And what we do, some would say, is cheating. We're actually adding a little bit of air to our reactor. And I say, that's not pyrolysis. And I'm saying, I can get the same products as you do with a conventional fast pyrolysis by bleeding in just a little bit of air. And what that does is it generates energy, thermal energy internal to the reactor. We don't have to get it into the reactor. It's already there. We just have to release it. Uh, it has, uh, um, and it's, if you talk about a so-called equivalence ratio, the amount of air that actually has to go in Combustion has equivalence ratio greater than one, right? You're putting a lot of air in to completely burn up the material where conventional pyrolysis sets it at zero. Gasification's up here between 0.15 and 0.35. We're down at like a four to 10% equivalence ratio. And that really is a very small uh, amount of, um, of uh, oxygen going into the system. Uh, it's interesting, this autothermal pyrolysis has dramatic process intensification. And I'm going to illustrate it here. We took the same uh, pilot scale reactor that ran as a conventional pyrolyzer, and it would, could process about five kilograms per hour and still get enough heat into the system. We couldn't put any more through it. Uh, and this shows the various products distributions. I'm not going to detail those right now. I want to save that for a later slide. But then we took that same reactor, instead of externally heating it, we bled a little bit of air in, and this is the amount of oxygen associated with that air. And we went from only being able to process five kilograms per hour over 15 kilograms per hour and got similar kinds of product distri distributions as the Sankey uh, diagram is illustrating. So we had the ability to actually build smaller reactors and get more throughput. Those are simpler reactors they're less expensive reactors. Uh, I've mentioned the importance of getting higher value products from pyrolysis. And I wanna point out about lignocellulosic biomass, whether it's wood or crop residues, uh, consist of lignocellulosic material, which has two important components. The ligno is the lignin, that's the, the red dusty stuff you see in a rotting tree uh, versus the cellulose, the white fibers that are, are is in biomass. That cellulose goes to sugar if we can do it right. Uh, traditionally, you don't get that out of pyrolysis. We've learned how to do that. Uh, and the lignin produces a, an oil that looks much like petroleum. And we would like to turn this into renewable diesel. Uh, I can go to the next slide. So we've developed, the, based on this research on autothermal pyrolysis and getting a valorization out of the products, we've developed a concept for a pyrolysis biorefinery using the autothermal pyrolysis to basically deconstruct the biomass and produce different streams. This is, this is sugar from, from biomass. This is, this is what they were trying to do over in the DuPont plant and were not successful at. They used enzymes, we use heat to do that. Uh, their lignin was a, still a solid, we've turned it into a liquid. Uh, there's some other streams and of course there's the biochar. Uh, we're looking at how we can convert these, uh, the unrefined sugar, phenolic oil, and the biochar into first generation products, which could include things like ethanol and uh, marine fuel. We've also produced a bioasphalt and then potentially go to some really high value products because our sugars are quite different than what they were producing uh, from enzymatic hydrolysis. It's actually a, 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 what they call a, a, a dehydrated sugar. Uh, and hydro sugar. So I won't spend any more time on that other than say that's a concept. And what we've tied to that, uh, we heard the issue of how do you scale up? How do you get there? 
well, we're not going to propose to build bigger and bigger plants. We're proposing to build more and more small plants. And the way you do that is a technology called small modular manufacturing. That's a word that has actually been picked up by the nuclear industry, building small modular plants. We want to do the same thing with pyrolysis refiners, where the, essentially what you do is um, you build unit operations of a pyrolysis plant in a factory. You put them on the back of a flat a, a truck, you truck it to the location, and then essentially you snap the, these uh, unit operations together as if it was a, a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the other thing that's important to be able to enable this kind of modular manufacturing is to make sure your, your unit operations have very high intensification. That is for smaller amounts of inputs, you get more outputs uh, from the system. Uh, I'm gonna show you how we've taken the, these concepts and put them together in a, a demonstration plant. But before I show that to you, I wanna show you how important it is to get valorization out of more than biochar. So what I'm plotting here is the price of sugar on the, on the markets today. And you see they fluctuate a lot. They've been as high as 700. They've settled down to something on the order of three, $300 a ton. And what I'm plotting against it is the uh, dollars per ton of CO2 uh, removed. In other words, this is the cost of carbon removal in the form of biochar. When the price of sugar is low, the cost of sequestration is high. But when prices of sugar are relatively high, we see these actually uh, going down to virtually zero, which actually means they're actually going negative cost. So what we're doing is we're enabling the uh, use of biochar as a carbon sequestering product, pro uh, product by having a products that are of higher value than the, the biochar itself. Uh, just for comparison, this is the range of current cost of direct air capture. It's in the range of $600 to $800 per ton of CO2 equivalent. Here we're down in points where, gosh, it's, it's for free. Carbon sequestration for, or I'm sorry, carbon removal for free. Uh, that brings me to my last two slides. Uh, we do have a first demonstration project. This is going to be a 50 ton per day pyrolysis plant that produces multiple products as shown here. Uh, we're starting with the phenolic oil and the biochar. The sugars will come later. Uh, this started from pilot plant work done at Iowa State, a company called Frontline Bioenergy. It has done the design and construction of this system and it is being funded by Stein Seed Company. Uh, Harry Stein, the owner, is very interested in biochar and has agreed that you, you can't make it work with biochar alone. You're going to have to produce other products as well. In fact, uh, this is what has been built. I, uh, Harry and I are standing there uh, to give you an idea. This isn't, this isn't, this is bigger than a bread box, so to speak. Uh, this is a 50 ton per day unit. Now, what I want to give a comparison to is there's something called the X prize for carbon removal, and the prize is $50 million to prove that you can remove 1,000 tons of CO2 equivalent in less than a year. Harry's system, based on pyrolysis corn stover, will accomplish that in an 80-day campaign, not, not 365 days. And there, um, that uh, stover that is produced, I'm sorry, the biochar produced is appropriate for covering 80 acres at a 10 ton per acre uh, application rate. So this just gives an idea. So we decided to, to go after the X prize. We put in an application for that and, and see where that's going to go. Uh, but it does show uh, there is incredible potential for biochar when you see these kinds of prizes being offered for carbon removal. Uh, that's my time, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, really appreciate your um, your insight here today. Uh, our next speaker, and and everyone, please, we will have a discussion at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. So our next speaker today is Dr. David Zilberman who is the uh, Robinson Chair and Professor of Agricultural Resource Economics at the uh, um, at University of California, Berkeley. And he's also a Wolf Prize winner in economics. He's written extensively on uh, economic systems. 
And so uh, he's going to be talking with us today about the opportunities and challenges to commercializing uh, commercialization of the pyrolysis biochar bioenergy uh, platform. Uh, David, you're on. David, we see your slides. Can't hear you yet. Can you, see, can, you, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, very good. Okay. Okay, so I'll start to speak about uh, 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 some general comments about the innovation, public and private car, uh, partnerships. Then I speak about the oil sector. What does, the, what does it expect? And then speak a little bit about the prospect of biochar. Now, uh, generally, we have a symbiotic supply chain. So generally speaking, we have two types of supply chain, innovation supply chain and product supply chain, and they are really symbiotic. So innovation supply chain is done a lot at the universities where you make discoveries. Uh, then uh, a lot of time you move to a uh, startup and private companies. And uh, one of the best things that happened in America in the last uh, 50 years, that a lot of time university professors and uh, universities have the patent and academia are involved in implementation and starting companies. And I think that a key element in biochar because you because it's academic and research ideas, but they really need most of the emphasis need to be done by the private sector. And having being able to have startup have a lot of facility to move the ball forward is really, really important. Now, as I said before, we have what I call the educational and ind uh, industrial complex, that almost everything that happened in biology was based on this element of switching from public and private, from university to industry, having uh, intellectual uh, properties that moving from one another and having academic involved in implementation. Because if we are not involved, no one, uh, no one will be able to understand what's going on. Now, the, now, uh, now, now, in terms of uh, what does it mean? That the more advanced biochar is, the more attractive it is to investors. So to some extent, is when you work in public research or you start a startup, you really need to have something that has much higher rate of return than uh, people think. Because generally speaking, the way that startup uh, an investor operates, they would really like to know, can they capture their money in five years. They cannot capture the money in five years, they wouldn't give you the money. And the same is with a lot, with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of other uh, sources of funding. So to some extent, a key element is to identify what are the most promising avenues in order to get the ball, uh, ball rolling and to move uh, forward. But to some extent, this is really crucial. So if you want to go to oil company, if you want to go to a developer, and you want to go to a, a, some environmentally sensitive firm, you want to go to some agribusiness, it's really important to show results that can that that uh, that that are, that are profitable. And the less you rely on subsidies, the better the better the better uh, off you are. Now, now I'd like to go to the oil sector. Now, if you look at the oil sector and the oil companies, they are really worried about the future. They know that uh, the long-term long survival is at risk, but the long run will come very far. You know what happened now with the war in, uh, in Ukraine? They are making a lot of money. So they are really having a, a dilemma how to manage the future versus uh, the present. And I was working with two companies in the last several years, and they basically uh, change speed and they change their strategy with respect uh, or, or to decarbonization. But still, with all the fits and stuff, there is a movement toward decarbonization. And I think that biochar can be a uh, part of it. But it's really, really uh, tricky to identify who is the partners. And now there are different types of companies and they have different strengths in terms of uh, reserves, discovery capacity, uh, refining, retailing, etc. So 
not every company is alike, and each company you need a different uh, approach. Now, if you look at company like Shell, BP, Total, they really like to have green strategies because they are in a European countries that have it. Also, they don't really have a lot of uh, reserve. Now, BP gave up a lot of the reserve in Russia. <coughs> so they will look at it favorably, but they got burned. So they are really, really careful. They also may start in Europe because there is more support there. So maybe it may be worthwhile to work with, <coughs> with some European partner. They may are a lot more likely to work in California or Texas because in California and Texas, and especially in California, the state is more supportive uh, to greenhouse gas uh, sequestration and uh, and and uh, moving uh, away from fossil fuel. So there is a low, a low carbon fuel standard. Now, so, so the European companies is one uh, avenue, Europe, Texas, California. Exxon doesn't speak about it, but they may do something. So finding a way to approach someone in Exxon and excite them about it can work, but they are really very careful. Now, uh, Chevron is, not, is still in fossil fuel. Uh, national companies in most countries are not uh, uh, interested in, uh, in a lot of stuff besides oil. Uh, even though I've seen in Brazil, uh, uh, I wouldn't go to the oil companies in Brazil, but I'm sure that in Brazil, in the sugar cane, there, is, there, is, there may be a good potential for biochar. And then Aramco, they would like to, uh, to decarbonate, they have a lot of money. So to some extent, there, there need to be some mechanism to approach oil companies when we have several better results, when we really use some of the oil combined with the biochar, it can be a mechanism for them uh, to, uh, 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 to show that they are moving toward the carbonization. What I am afraid that the results are up to now are not exciting enough, uh, so they wouldn't really want to make a move because they are afraid that once they make a move and the public knows about it, they cannot uh, reverse themselves. So generally speaking, they are operating very, very slowly. Now, 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 the other thing is this. Hey, David, I just want to yes. pause for a second. Your slides are still in the PowerPoint presentation, like you're in PowerPoint editing mode, and your slides are not advancing as you're speaking. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. I know what the problem is. Okay. Now, now I just want to okay. let you know. Now, is that okay? We're still seeing it in the presentation or like slide editing mode. You might want to stop share at the top. And then just reshare your slideshow. I, I stopped. Okay, I stop it. And I okay. And I yep. okay, and now just I, go share again. Oh man, and I and I share again. Okay, now it's okay. Perfect. There we go. Yep, all good. Okay. Now, as I said before, different companies have different uh, perspectives, uh, but uh, but. Uh, 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 for now, uh, and uh, for now, uh, and then they they have uh, it's really uh, 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 so another thing uh, element is that they would like to find a way to continue to use fossil fuel and launder it and clear uh, by either planting trees or other activities that will that allow them to sequester carbon so they can uh, produce uh, greenhouse gases. Now, for example, Shell has a huge amount of natural gas. They want to produce blue hydrogen, but they want to plant trees. They want to do 500 million things that will show that they sequester carbon. So they, uh, different type of biofuel, any way that they can really take advantage of the uh, natural gas for as much time uh, as, as possible. So thinking about how you can uh, use the sequestration of uh, carbon with uh, biochar, produce some oil and work with a company like Shell or any other company that has natural gas, that can be uh, that can be a good strategy. You don't need to do it tomorrow. It can be done in five or six years, but combining it can be very, very good. If you can, uh, you have biochar and you can plant trees in a certain area that you cannot plant trees because, before because, it, because the soil quality is low. Planting trees, they love planting trees because 
it's obvious, you have greenhouse gas sequestration, uh, 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 you have carbon sequestration. So this is something that they, that they like, that they, that they like. I don't know if uh, biochar can be associated with aquaculture or algae or stuff like this. This may be crazy. Things like this can help because I know that people are interested. Now, uh, policy makers speak about the carbonization, but they don't always walk the talk. Uh, the talk. One thing that is really good is the low carbon fuel standard in California. It's a good policy that really encourages uh, carbonization. The standard uh, hopefully is going down all the time. That's the reason that companies are uh, trying to go to California uh, to introduce uh, uh, policies that reduce uh, carbon that is used uh, for uh, transportation. Having a policy like this in the US will be great. It will be great for biofuel and it will be extremely good uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to biochar. Uh, now, EU carbon trading doesn't apply to, uh, to fuel, but, uh, it may, but, but, but uh, it may apply. Also, the EU will have some element of carbon uh, border adjustment that will apply to steel, uh, cement, and aluminum. Hopefully, it will apply uh, to fuel, and then suddenly it will uh, make uh, biochar uh, more, 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 uh, more effective. I, I, I think that what David did, and almost every time that I work with a company, the key element that you see is that you need to, you need to have a price for carbon. As I said before, there are several places that have it, and uh, and so you, you have to go to these places and you have to go to the, uh, 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 to make the best case. Now, what does the biochar uh, provide? provide? It will provide the carbon credit, provide alternative fuel or oil, generate a new revenue source, increase yield. But uh, the, so the industry, if you make the case, the industry uh, will support research it, uh, if the challenge is to establish commercialization, and if you can, uh, if you can uh, show where you can develop a critical mass of use of biochar that will make a lot of money. So to me, for example, the Midwest is nice, but I'm not sure that the Midwest may be as profitable if you go to a certain developing country that have a huge potential to produce high value crop, but suffer because of biochar. Or if you go to a place like uh, California, where they have a huge problem of uh, wood waste because of, and they really worry about fire, and if biochar can be uh, the, the, uh, the, the best alternative to deal with, uh, to reduce the risk of fire, because we have incredible amounts of dead wood and we don't know what to do with it, that can work. So to me, the key challenge is to think in terms of, and, and to think about, uh, business packages, and you need to have many business packages in order to be successful and to go to different uh, to different groups. That is on one hand. On the other hand, is to have papers that go that are public in good journals that really show results that that are really really uh, amazing. And I think that uh, the, the, I, I, I spoke with people uh, in uh, oil companies and. Uh, I spoke with people that uh, in Shell and BP, and I spoke with some people that work, uh, some faculties that work in Exxon. The big thing about the big problem about that, it doesn't have a reputation of something that can make the that can generate quick bucks. It's something that has potential in the long run. So generally, when you have a potential, uh, when people think that you have a potential in the long run, they don't pay attention. So what you really, what we really need to do is to identify the two or three projects that are re that can have an immediate impact to work hard and uh, and, 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 and and promote them and and the next thing that I really think is is, is crucial is uh, identify uh, is uh, is a develop is a work with a lot of environmental group when they speak about the uh, uh, pricing carbon or other things to show how biochar can benefit and something good can happen if you introduce some uh, uh, carbon pricing. I don't see why we do, why if, for example, one of the states in the Midwest will start paying, let's say, $40 uh, 
total of carbon, it will make, it will be a, it will be a game changer uh, for, uh, for any, uh, anyone else. And the last thing is, when you have a, play, a state like California that have a fire problem, it may not be a bad idea to say, gosh, biochar can be, uh, can come to the rescue. So altogether, I think that uh, there is a lot of potential there. There need to be more research because the more advanced the research, the easier is the commercialization. I really think that the key is to identify sweet, uh, sweet spots where it can work, to have a success stories. I think that the, that the stand device is a fantastic uh, element uh, uh, of, promotion, uh, of promotion and demonstration. And uh, I really think that you need to have a team of uh, master, student, uh, MBA type who all the time start to think about different type of configurations that can work. And you need to approach a lot of uh, oil companies, land developer companies, investors that know that, that will know that biochar is not something that will come 50 years from now, but may be viable in five or 10 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, really appreciate uh, your contribution here. Again, please save your questions for the end uh, discussion period. Now, next up on our uh, agenda today is uh, D Dale Smith, who's the Director of Enterprise Environmental Sustainab Sustainability at the Boeing Company. So he's going to be talking with us today about uh, Boeing and commercial aviation industry perspectives on sustainable aviation fuels. Um, Dale, uh, you're on. Are you there, Dale? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my screen? Uh, yep, we see the windows. Yep, Dale, right now we are seeing your Windows desktop screen. Ah. I'm not sure if you have numerous screens and you're possibly just sharing desktop two. We need to be sharing desktop one. Any luck there? Nope. Nope, we are still seeing just a little, which is fine. There we go. We're hey. seeing it come in. Okay. Seeing it go full screen. Perfect. All right. And sorry about that. There we go. And then it's full screen. Perfect. All right. Looking good. There we go. That's my multi the old multiple screen problem. Right? I know. That's a good thing, though. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> hey, thanks for this opportunity, and we'll jump right in. So. Um, this is kind of a high level view of how we, uh, uh, as, uh, as Boeing and our participation in the commercial aviation industry, uh, see where all this is headed and, and how this provides some, um, some context for how important um, sustainable aviation fuels are uh, in particular. Um, and of course, the different elements, uh, and we can talk a little bit about that, uh, how it might relate specifically to, um, to the biochar uh, arena. I get the privilege to work in our enterprise environmental sustainability team, very focused on, on sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, and in particular, I'm focused on our SAP producers and SAP policy work. I have a colleague, Joe Ellsworth, uh, who was also engaged in this originally. Uh, he's on, a, on travel and so I'm filling in for him as well. He works our business development activities with specific uh, emerging technologies uh, and producers to understand how we play. We do use a a significant amount of jet fuel, of course, in our operations, but the primary objective, of course, is for the, the whole commercial aviation industry, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Go forward. Our, our view, I'm just going to show a few charts, to just put, put some words to, to, to how we see the world going forward into 2050, uh, being the focal point uh, for decarbonization uh, for all sectors uh, related to, to, to climate change issues. We want a future where people can still travel uh, when and where they they want, and, but do it in a way that uh, at, the, at the core of sustainability, do it in a way that it does not impact our share of the world now, 
or for the future. Uh, the challenge here with climate change requires transforming uh, the future of flight, uh, uh, which is, of course, the business that we're in for, for literally billions of passengers. It's a, it's a daunting task, but we've done this with renewable energy. If you think about it uh, in terms of renewable electricity and other renewable energy sources, uh, and, and we, we, we know we can do this, we just have to really stay focused. And the focus has to be on an interdisciplinary approach talk some more about that, those interdisciplinary approaches uh, and, and you know, what that means uh, in, in context as we, as we go forward here. There is a very, very, very focused effort on 2050. Certainly you've seen it all in the news around uh, what we're focused on uh, globally in, in making sure that we address the, the, the heart and science of climate change. Um, uh, there, there have been updated reports, of course, that, that you all are aware of in terms of what that means in terms of global temperature increases and a, target, a, a real strong target for decarbonization uh, in all sectors by 2050. We see that through really three different elements that are represented by the graphics uh, on this chart. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about them in order and then we'll dive into to the sustainable aviation fuel component, which is uh, related to the one on the left. Um, sorry, hang on just a second. Okay. Um, so our airplanes, which you can certainly recognize, are reflected by the one in the air on, on the, in the left panel there. Uh, these are uh, significant and incredible assets um, and machines that are going to be in service for quite some time. The airplanes that we're putting into service today are likely going to be in service 20, 30, and in some cases even 40 years from now. Uh, because of the value proposition uh, that they represent, uh, both in passenger and cargo service. Uh, there are uh, new airplane designs that we are always looking at uh, for our market niche. Um, and you'll see some more about that when I talk about it. But also the, uh, the other characterizations in this in the graphic on this page are really understanding that there, there will be changes in the way people fly um, and, and the way they connect to the commercial aviation system between now and 2050. Uh, we know that renewable energy um, electricity will be a significant piece of that as reflected in the, in the wind farm here uh, that, that you see, but, but also just the nature of how people move and connect into the global hubs for commercial aviation. Um, we, we've been a part of that transformation with some of our products that allow people to go more direct from what all of us that fly like to go from where we're starting to where we want to, to as close as possible to where we want to end and to do it in as few stops as possible. Um, and different airplanes uh, and, and, and different um, and developments that we're putting into the into the fleet are, are going to continue to allow that. And then on the right, there is a you know big move afoot for urban air mobility. It's a challenging space when you think about it, but um, we are certainly there to understand how some of the technologies around electric airplanes, hydrogen airplanes, those kinds of things might might play into that. Specifically, um, it really is going to be about fleet renewal. Uh, which is bringing new technologies and those fuel efficiencies uh, and, and the associated carbon emission reductions that come from those uh, fuel efficiencies, but also about how we operate the airplanes and working with our, our customers, the airlines, on, on how to uh, operate the airplanes in the most uh, efficient manner. Uh, and then there's this renewable energy transition uh, that really is comparable uh, to uh, the renewable electricity uh, and, uh, and other uh, renewable energy sectors in terms of displacing fossil fuels. Um, and specifically, it's going to be about sustainable aviation fuels because of the need to be able to uh, provide drop-in low carbon solutions uh, for these airplanes that are gonna be in the market for, for a long time. And then we are working on advanced technologies, uh, as I mentioned. So again, highlighting uh, we need to operate the current and next generation fleet with renewable energy. And you can see some representations here of that in, in terms of in the, in the front, you see a, an electric taxi. It's also connected to that truss brace wing airplane, which is a slight modification and design around some opportunities for improving um, the aerodynamics in, in, in our in airplanes. Um, these are you know, ground operations, the, the, the electric taxi, and there, there will be other things associated with ground operations. And then of course, it, it really is about um, the, uh, fleet renewal. So what are we doing now in this space? Um, I want to talk real, just briefly about our eco demonstrator program, about our commitment um, for our airplanes to be compatible with 100% sustainable aviation fuels 
And then what we're doing in terms of using SAF ourselves uh, and, and a specific partnership that we announced recently. Um, oops, sorry. So the Boeing Eco Demonstrator Program um, is a very important piece of our portfolio. Um, we've been operating it for actually about 12 years on nine different platforms. Uh, we bring in new, new technologies to demonstrate and test. Uh, we have more than 200 of those uh, partnerships across our industry uh, and with regulators to understand what we can bring to the airplane. Um, the airplane you see here is a 777-200 uh, uh, in our Eco Demonstrator livery. We, we have this airplane and, and, and another that we use in this program, but we also partner with our airline customers to use their platforms uh, and partner with them in doing this on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, it, as an example, uh, in 2018, we partnered with Fed, FedEx and used a 777 freighter to be the first commercial flight using 100% SAF. So, so no fossil uh, content in that fuel. And then we operate these eco demonstrator uh, platforms and have for the last three years on the highest currently approved commercial blend ratio of 50-50. This program is to innovate, collaborate, and accelerate um, not only our environmental based technologies, uh, but, um, including sustainable aviation fuels, but also uh, safety and other aerodynamic improvements. The uh, significant announcement uh, early last year uh, uh, in this context is we, we committed that our airplanes that we start delivering in by 2030 um, are, are going to be compatible to, to uh, on 100% sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, again, which would simply mean no fossil content. Um, these are synthetic fuels. Uh, as I've already mentioned, they have been, there are pathways that have been approved at a 50-50 blend ratio. Um, but we know that in, this is all about decarbonizing commercial aviation. And to do that, it's going to, we're going to need uh, large volumes, as in uh, 100 billion gallons. Uh, Pre-pandemic -pre was, the, was the global um, jet fuel used for commercial, avi commercial aviation. So, so we have to have billions and billions of gallons, uh, and they need to be, uh, those gallons need to be predominantly non-fossil. Uh, in the 2035, 2040, you know, time range, maybe 2045, we need to ramp up to that now. So I'm pausing on that to say, we, the reason we've made this commitment is that we want these airplanes to be compatible with those fuels when they start to come into the commercial market. We don't anticipate there being large volumes in 2030, but, but given the nature of our products, we have to anticipate these things and have, have the technologies available to be able to use those fuels, have the airplane be compatible with those fuels starting in 2030. But we're doing that work now to understand the dynamics with those synthetic fuels as they operate inside the airplane's uh, fuel systems and engines. And then this is about um, scaling up the, the global supply uh, for SAF. In any energy transition, this is a really significant, complicated task. So we want to practice what we preach. Uh, and we uh, have started this year. Uh, we made an announcement in February. We're purchasing 2 million gallons for our own use, working on some book and claim approaches to that, which is similar to renewable electricity. Uh, and we're, we just issued an RFP for additional uh, fuel to be purchasing in the next few years um, and ramping that up for some internal goals that we have to displace fossil jet fuel for our own use. Um, that allows us to engage in the industry in a way to understand how the technologies are advancing. We also have a partnership with a group called Sky Energy. They uh, have a global profile. We're working with them um, on teaming to see how commercialization of these fuels is going to happen going forward and then also on some specific projects. They have a, a, a division called Sky Americas, uh, and uh, we're working with them on a specific project in the Pacific Northwest to identify some feedstocks and ways to deliver some, some commercially viable um, SAF. Um, we have been involved in industry leadership uh, within the sustainable aviation fuel arena for about 15 years. Um, and we will continue uh, to, to just keep ramping that up. We've added a lot of sustainability, like, like a lot of folks, to our corporate structure, but also specifically uh, on, on helping encourage the sustainable aviation fuel uh, marketplace. And then as part of that, 
uh, a big piece of this is going to be about policy. So when you think about the kinds of public policies that came in play to incentivize uh, solar electricity and wind electricity, um, it's going to be the, the same kinds of things that are needed to, to, to kickstart this market um, and, and make it work. Uh, I just want to pause on this one because there's a number of variations of this. Uh, obviously, this is a definition of what we mean by sustainable fuels. Uh, they're drop-in, they're non-fossil, um, and, and they come from a wide variety of sources. And of course, this is where the biochar uh, comes into the, comes into the flow. So there are a number of different ways to get at these fuels. Um, certainly from biomass, uh, uh, of course, for, for you guys and your interest, but also there are other methods through um, other waste products in industrial waste gases, uh, landfill gases, um, you know, other sources of, of, of synthetic gases. And I think, uh, oh, sorry, just to really put a, a highlight on how the industry sees this and, and how we understand how this is going to play out. You see on the left hand side, these are the market niches, market sizes, as we talked about the commercial aviation arena, everything from smaller planes at the commuter level uh, into long haul. And uh, you can see the percentages under each of those sections of the total industry CO2. So when you get, uh, you know, you get down into short haul, which is 24%. That, um, and, and medium haul and long haul. That, that is the, the, the lion's share of emissions. These are the large airplanes that we build. Um, and because of the physics involved and the challenges around these energy transitions, sustainable aviation fuels are going to be in play across the board for a long time. Uh, there are some hydrogen and electric applications that, that we'll be looking at. They'll come up through the smaller airplanes and, and, uh, and they might come into play uh, 2060, 2070. But from a Decarbonization perspective, it's going to be sustainable aviation fuels that, that, that take us there. Uh, this information comes from a, a, a report called Waypoint 2050 from Air Transport Action Group. It just suggests if you have interest in really diving in any deeper, that you can uh, you can tackle it. Uh, it's a hundred page report, pretty dense, but uh, readily available at the ATAG uh, website through Waypoint 2050. Uh, if you just search on that, you'll find it, um, and it's it's well worth the read if you want to understand better what we're doing in the industry. Um, and the real cut to the chase there is that in that report, sorry, uh, we've done a really good job uh, since 1990 uh, and and even before because of the the importance of fuel efficiency in reduce reducing our carbon footprint because it's a proxy for fuel burn um, and noise as well. But we got a long way to go. Um, so. We, the key here is that to get at this gap, to get us down to, uh, to, to decarbonize by 2050, it's going to take a combination of things, including some market measures and, and some offsets uh, to, to get that final stage. Um, but the cut to the chase here through that ATAG waypoint report, you're going to see that there are these three or four scenarios. The first one, of course, never left is business as usual. We're not going to do that. But every one of these that you see if you look at the green font, basically, that's the scale of sustainable aviation fuels that are going to be required to meet these carbon emission reductions. So, and many, many of those are going to come from biomass sources, uh, which, of course, is the, the space that you guys are, are looking at. So, I will pause there um, and see if there are, I guess we'll have questions later. But that's what I've got for today. Uh, thank you very much, Dale. Uh, we appreciate hearing from Boeing and, and your clearly set for us uh, a huge demand for the sustainable fuels. Our final uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Uh, Nicole uh, Fitzgerald. She comes from the Department of Energy uh, Bioenergy Technology Office. And uh, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald has a PhD in chemistry from Stanford. And uh, within uh, BETO, she manages both the advanced algae systems and the feedstock technology programs within um, uh, uh, BETO. So, Dr. Uh, Fitzgerald. Great. Can you guys hear me okay and see my screen? Uh, we can, yes, we, we can. can. Great. So, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, as David said, I'm a, I'm a program manager at the U.S. Department of Energy uh, Bioenergy Technologies Office, or BETO, and I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk to you about our strategy for developing uh, low-carbon aviation and shipping biofuels. Um, so I'll start off um, telling you a little bit about what our 
what our organization does, um, particularly our strategy towards decarbonizing the aviation sector. Um, and then I'll talk to you about what we think are the major barriers to commercializing pyrolysis processes and the implications for co-producing biochar. Um, and I'll touch briefly on marine fuels, which is a relatively new focus for us, and then um, end with a few thoughts about how to best to work with us. Um, I know that we're a little bit behind schedule, so I might um, skip a couple slides here. But um, so just some quick information about BETO. Um, we are appropriated at about $250 million annually, uh, and we spend almost all of that on funding researchers. Um, under the current administration, uh, decarbonization of the economy is our highest priority. So about 34% of emissions in the U.S. are due to the transportation sector. Um, and Similarly to what Dale just talked about, you know, electrification is going to be a solution for parts of the transportation sector for sure. Um, but we know that, you know, for long haul and near term aviation sector needs, um, we really need to focus on SAS. Um, so we are working towards the goal of enabling production of 35 billion gallons of SAS by 2050, um, which is what 100% of the projected need. Um, so the way our office does this is by funding targeted research to tackle specific challenges along the supply chain. So um, that can mean we would fund research on novel catalysts for catalytic fast pyrolysis, um, or we would fund demonstration of sustainable agronomic practices or biochar research. So um, everything along the supply chain to make this as a goal a reality is um, something we would um, consider funding. Um, and then one note, although we're part of the transportation division within um, our office or EERE, um, we do much more than that. Um, biomass is the only renewable source of carbon that's out there and is becoming increasingly more in demand as it helps uh, as a mean of reaching uh, zero carbon emissions um, economy. So in order to achieve our strategic goals, we're organized um, across the supply chain and we have smaller groups focusing on more tractable goals. So we have a feedstocks program, um, which uh, I manage that focuses on lowering the cost of improving the quality of renewable carbon feedstocks. So we deal with things like the issues that Dr. Laird showed on one of his early slides where uh, DuPont was dealing with spontaneous combustion of collected corn stover. Um, some of the feedstocks we address include agricultural waste like corn silver, or feedstock, uh, forest residues, energy crops, uh, waste like sludge, um, municipal solid waste, and even CO2. Uh, the only feedstock that that team does not address is our other team, which is algae team. And they have, um, the algae program has um, a lot of unique challenges that are totally different that um, we tackle there. Uh, we also have a conversion program uh, which develops conversion technologies. Um, and that's where you would find um, our pyrolysis research. That would be of interest to this group. Uh, we also have a systems development and integration program, uh, which aims to reduce technology uncertainty and bioenergy uh, by integrating individual technologies into a system. Um, this, house, this program also houses our scale-up work and occasionally funds pilot work. Um, they fund uh, several biomass process demonstration units or PDUs across the country. And these PDUs are a great resource for re researchers who wanna test out their processes on larger scale. Um, so to, to be able to, to demonstrate um, large scale um, fuel or biochar production. And then finally, we have a data modeling analysis team which supports the program with decision-making and uh, develop science-based strategies to understand the um, and enhance the economic and environmental benefits of advanced bioenergy. So, um, like I mentioned, we are really focused on SAF. Um, the, the aviation sector will be one of the most difficult sectors to decarbonize and will require liquid fuels. Um, there's great demand for SAF right now. Airlines are scrambling to sign off tape agreements with SAF producers. Um, we've been working with the U.S. DA and Department of Transportation to set targets for displacing fossil-based fuels with SAS. Um, the hope is to produce 3 billion gallons per year by 2030, or roughly 10% of the projected non-military aviation fuel demand, and then 100% by 2050. Um, and one of the questions in the, the chat kind of addressed this, and I'll, I'll talk about this more in a minute, um, but the amount of biomass that we hypothetically could have available could only pr produce about 62 billion gallons of fuel per year. 
Um, and that involves a wide variety of feedstocks. So when we talk about decarbonizing the transportation sector, we really need to see electrification of light and medium duty vehicles um, and really devote um, our, renewable, our renewable carbon resources to decarbonizing aviation. Um, and I'm gonna skip this slide just to say, you know, if we did embark in a large scale SAF sector, um, it would have major benefits for the United States. Um, moving, moving along, um, we estimate that we need over 600 million tons of biomass and waste annually to produce that 35 billion gallons a year of SAF. SAF. Um, this assumes that we're using um, the conversion technologies we have available to us now. Um, so many of you might or might not be familiar with our billion ton study. This is a comprehensive assessment of the nation's biomass and waste resources. Uh, the last iteration of the billion ton study, which was published in 2016, estimates that if energy crops were to come online, um, we would have access to more than a billion tons of sustainably produced biomass. So that is well more than what we would need to make that 35 billion gallons a year of SAF. Um, but it's important to note that there's no single resource type that's sufficient on its own. Um, and so you can kind of see that in that green bar on the right. Um, even, even kind of in the most rosy, uh, scenarios, looking at um, uh, uh, best case scenarios, um, you, you would need to have um, a whole variety of resources to address that 35 billion gallons. Um, so you, you couldn't have a single situation where all of the SAS um, comes from, say, pyrolysis of forest residues. So that's why it's a critical for our office that we develop a variety of technologies for a variety of feedstocks. Um, and also just a quick note, um, we are in the process of updating that resource assessment and we um, anticipate releasing that at the end of 2023. So if you're interested in that, please stay tuned for that. Um, so each region of the US has different renewable car carbon resources to offer. So this is great in terms of increasing supply resilience and spreading economic and environmental benefits across the nation. Uh, this picture assumes a resource density of greater than 50 tons per square mile, which is the density uh, you need to supply uh, small biorefinery economically. So with the diversity of feedstocks, we need a diversity of conversion technologies. Our office has been working towards feedstock agnostic conversion pathways, but the reality is that some feedstocks are more amenable to certain conversion technologies. Um, so certain um, conversion technologies, technologies require uh, specific resources like HEPA, uh, requires lipid-based feedstocks, um, like from fat soils and greases or algae. Um, other technologies have less restrictive specifications like pyrolysis. Um, early pyrolysis work was really focused on wood-based feedstocks, but um, uh, many researchers, like including Dr. Brown, have shown that pyrolysis technologies um, have evolved to take on a wide variety of waste and herbaceous materials. Um, so the next few slides, I'm going to show the promise of pyrolysis to produce low greenhouse gas emissions and cost-effective biofuels. Um, so our, our office studies a variety of SAF production pathways, and we periodically publish cost estimates for those pathways. I'll caveat by saying that these um, uh, cost estimates are um, nth plant modeled, um, and so they have a little bit, um, definitely a bit rosier than what the reality is of if you were to maybe um, try to do one of these processes today. Um, so, but we do know that pyrolysis groups can make fuels with significantly lower carbon intensities than fossil-based fuels. Uh, we also know that catalytic fast pyrolysis can make uh, cost-competitive fuels approaching $3 per gallon in modeled end plant setting. Um, and I think most relevant to this audience, we know that we can lower both the minimum fuel selling price and the greenhouse gas emissions of CFP or catalytic fast pyrolysis based fuels by co-producing biochar. Um, so I'll talk about that more in a second, but I just really want to emphasize that um, fuel production really needs to be cost competitive. So even with tax incentives and policy mandates and folks willing to pay a green premium, uh, we need to continue to lower the cost of biofuel production to really see widespread use of SAF. So some companies are making great headway on this. Uh, Dr. Brown listed a handful of companies that have given this a whirl. I'll add one to his list. Um, Alder Fuels is attempting to make SAF via pyrolysis. Um, and they've gotten a lot of press uh, 
uh, recently. Um, they're using woody biomass as their feedstock, but um, they can accommodate other feedstocks like ag residues. Um, they plan to hydro treat the bio, bio crude within existing refinery infrastructure to lower costs. Um, their product process does co-produce biochar. Um, um, I am not sure if they're planning on uh, selling that to try to um, increase revenue. Um, lots of folks are really excited about this company and they already have offtake agreements with United. So like I mentioned, biochar has the potential to be a great co-product for fast pyrolysis pathways. Uh, this is preliminary analysis by NREL or the National Renewable Energy Lab. And it shows that you can sell the biochar co-product for about, if you could sell it for $300 per ton, you could lower the um, minimum fuel selling price or MSFP of the fuel by about 10 cents per gallon. That's a significant amount of cost savings. And it's not an intuitive result given that you have to add capital expense for separating out the char. Um, and previously, they were using the char as essentially free fuel to help power the reactor. So uh, this is an interesting result um, and I think should be explored further. Um, I will say though, um, for biochar production, there's definitely a bit of perception issue, at least among some biofuels researchers and producers. Um, it's hard to convince folks that I work with that biochar is a better co-product to produce than a drop in replacement like acetone. Uh, so this analysis you can see um, looked at um, acetone or TB known as co-products uh, to make, to lower the cost of the fuel production. Um, so there's definitely concerns um, that th their biochar isn't always helpful and has no real market need. Um, the quality specifications of biochar need to be better defined. Uh, different processes will produce different qualities of char. I noticed that that was discussed in the chat a little bit and which ones are actually the most effective. Um, there's concerns that processes to make biochar will also co-produce co PAHs and other potentially dangerous compounds that would, you know, maybe inadvertently pollute. Um, I read the integrated biochar research roadmap with great interest. Um, some of the expected results outlined in there um, are exactly what need to be addressed before researchers can really coalesce around biochar as being a great co-product for fuels production, um, such as validating biochar carbon drawdown potential, quantifying the economic potential of using biochar, standardizing quality specs, et cetera. Um, biochar, or, or excuse me, biofuel producers need to know why it's better to sell biochar as a co-product than burn it to power their process. So beyond developing co-products that help reduce the MSFP, what are the other barriers to commercializing pyrolysis processes? First, uh, feedstock cost. Uh, right now, people can imagine getting waste feedstocks for very cheap, um, but that will not always be the case. Um, our analysis suggests that we really can't get much lower than uh, a feedstock cost contributing roughly $1 per gallon. Um, and also, I mean, keep in mind the cheaper that feedstock cost usually means the lower the quality of the feedstock and then more difficult to convert. So you might save on the cost of the feedstock, but then you have to introduce more pre-processing step to clean up that feedstock to get it ready for conversion. So you're not really saving. Um, so that, that $1 per gallon uh, is our benchmark. Um, catalyst costs are a huge expense. You can see the red bar that in part represents the catalytic vapor upgrading. So improving carbon efficiency, ensuring that the biogenic carbon that makes it into your final product and not into your waste stream is another huge barrier to address. Um, making biofuels that require um, quite a bit of hydrogen um, and when you and where you get that hydrogen and the LCA profile of that hydrogen can make a big difference. Um, finally, separation is efficient comes up again and again as a major barrier to, pre to preventing cost-effective fast pyrolysis pathways. Um, I'll note that our office is funding opportunities and research consortia to address these issues. We have a consortium called ChemCat Bio, which tries to address the hurdles to catalysis in bioenergy. Uh, we have a whole separations research consortium. Uh, we had a funding opportunity a few years back called Chase which stood for carbon, hydrogen, and separation efficiency. Uh, so these are issues that our office thinks about often and uh, tries to uh, address with targeted applied R&D. Uh, one quick note about biochar that I think many of you are familiar with, um, biochar is not only important for potentially bringing down the cost of the biofuel, uh, but 
it also reduces the greenhouse gas potential of pyrolysis derived biofuels. So in this example from Argonne National Lab, biochar applications to the soil can reduce the life cycle GHG emissions for that pyrolysis based fuels. Uh, there's certainly a lot of variability in these results, um, depending on the assumptions that go into the calculations, but the general point is that biochar can be a great solution for making low GHG fuels. And uh, finally, because I know that this meeting was um, also to address uh, marine fuels, I just wanted to add a note that um, analysis funded by our office shows that pyrolysis can be a competitive route to marine fuels uh, based on low carbon intensity and ec economics. Uh, Argon and NREL have compared a variety of pathways that produce marine fuels and show that pyrolysis oils have low life cycle GHG emissions compared to other pathways. Uh, biochar co-production could further improve the LCA. Uh, preliminary TEA um, at Oak Ridge National Lab uh, shows that bio oil made from fast paralysis could be cost competitive with heavy fuel oil um, currently used for marine fuels. So lots, lots of promise here. Um, so finally, I just wanna close by saying there's a lot of great ways to work with us. Um, we fund researchers through a variety of mechanisms and I'd be happy to talk with any of you um, uh, more about that. And finally, this is my contact information. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you so much. And thank you again to all of the speakers. We were very lucky in that we had a very active chat. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I do think, um, I feel as though a number of the questions asked uh, to Robert, have already been answered as well as David. And some of the questions that people have for Dale, Nicole covered in her presentation. So I might just pull out one question that one or two questions that um, I don't know if they were covered. So I think that there was a question to Nicole from Alex around how we could change agriculture in order to allow for crop land to be converted from grains to energy crops and I'm gonna see if there was another one that, and you can choose which one you might like to answer. Um, so, and then another question again from Alex was, what about potential for alcohol to jet to supplement? So dealer's choice, whichever one you'd like to cover. And then I think I'll try to see if there was another question for Dale while you answer that. Oh, I think you're still muted. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I can answer both of those uh, quickly, I hope. Um, so alcohol to jet is gonna be a huge part of the solution. Um, and I, sh I should have mentioned that, so I had uh, starch in there. Um, so, you know, as uh, we de decarbonize the, or electrify the light duty vehicle sector, there's gonna be less need for ethanol um, there. Uh, and we anticipate using that ethanol for alcohol to jet to make that SAF. So definitely that's gonna be part of the equation. Um, and then, yeah, so when we do our analysis to understand where we would put energy crops, uh, it's not, um, we are careful to assume that it's not displacing any sort of food or changing any of the um, current uses of that land. Um, and also I wanna point out that energy crops um, or cover crops can be uh, put in, um, interspersed within existing uh, land that's used for other purposes. And so you can um, enhance the, the types of uh, residues and feedstocks that you're getting from already existing land. Thank you so much. And I think I have one question for Dale and then we can close this out. I believe most of the questions were addressed in the chat, but as we noted yesterday, we'll also have a white paper, which I hope can answer some of these questions. So, cause we're recording all the questions as well. So the one question that I saw for Dale that I don't think was addressed in the chat was around from Chuck around, uh, could Boeing work with us to persuade an oil refiner to commit some capacity to refining fire crude from pyrolysis into SAF? I see you unmuted, Dale, but I don't, we don't hear anything. Uh, we may be having some connection issues. 
That is okay. We can address that. Um, well, if we get Dale back while I'm explaining kind of the next portion, we'll allow him to answer the question. And if not, then um, we can try and follow up later. So again, thank everyone for the time and attention. David, that was a great session that you moderated. Um, um, Ryan, could you put up uh, the breakout question slide, please? So um, prior to our break, we'll have a short break. And then as you come back, you'll be put into automatically your breakout groups. And again, for those of you who were with us yesterday, each breakout group will have a facilitator and also a reporter. Um, I took the job of reporting for my group, but you can identify a different reporter if you would like. Um, and in these small groups, we will address the five questions you see above you. They will also be put back in your group so you don't have to write these down or remember where they are. And they'll also be put in the chat so that you have access to review these five questions. Um, I believe we'll be able to take a 10 minute break and come back at two on the hour and then that will allow us an hour in our breakout groups and then we can get back on track and um, according to the agenda we can do our report out at three o'clock so we'll come back at two and as soon as you come back in you'll be moved to your uh, uh, breakout group so see you back at two o'clock And uh, Ryan will chime in shortly to tell us what happens next. Ryan, are you there? All right, everyone. I'm waiting till everyone rejoins from the break. Uh, welcome back from the break, everyone. Before I launch, the breakout room is just wanted you to all look at the breakout room slide that is currently up. These are the questions that you will be going over in your breakout rooms. I'm gonna be launching those breakout rooms here in a moment and you'll be automatically pushed to the breakout room. If you need any assistance while you're in that breakout room, please click the little leave breakout room button and you'll be pushed right back to the main session. All right, everyone, I'm going to be launching you all into your breakout rooms. Have fun.
please. SpongeBob to serve. All right, you. Perfect. Returned by Cap. No, no. There's some strange reason that Terra does that and smashes the tube. Is that? Yes, it's Michelangelo. Who follows it to a different Michelangelo? Who follows it to a huge Arnold? Who reads it from the line to Perfume? Who somehow finds us out. antithetical to my beliefs, but here I am doing this. Yes, hello, GQ, I'm Nicholas Cage, and today I'm going undercover on the... It's actually me, it's it's Luke Cage. Reddit, there is a summer. I heard about it. I did hear that Reddit has a, some, something about me. Oh, yeah, I, I heard about it, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> That would be arrogant. What do you think the casting in this case? I can't answer that either because that would be arrogant for me to determine who I would recommend to somebody else. Next, TIL, that Nicholas Cage spent more than Somebody at the auction house should be in jail. T I L Nicholas Cage and Gary Coleman were the original choices to play Harry and Wood. Really? I didn't know that. I thought it was Jim from the beginning. <laughs> if you went to start, you, you start us because I, I, I like you a lot. Something that will surely change his future. We've gotten used to ASMR ear looking at hot tub streams, but it seems Twitch is now getting even more lenient on adult content. Streamer Gentle explained to Dr. Luplo how she got a survey suggesting that Twitch would be trying out more sexually explicit content. So now we're all wondering is Twitch still primarily a gaming platform? The TikTok YouTuber boxing? How could her a YouTuber? What does she do? Man, yo, yo. That was my best performance yet? That was hands down my best performance yet? Oh my god, I can't find. What is wrong? 
CT, you said again? Yep. Yeah, that, was, that was huge. So we're here to uh, give a documentary, though. To give an Oscar. <laughs> wow. Is that a bit? That doesn't look like a bit. I don't know, man. What's up, man? Yeah, how you doing? Talk to you about myself. Hey, is this your son? Yeah, my son is actually one. Well, right, I want to talk to you about your son's conduct. Is this the guy with the mysterious guy with the hoodie comes in and kicks everybody's asses? I love it. It's not the only it's that you're serious. On the internet, it's, it's kind of weird. Is it inappropriate? It's a little bit over, yes. Oh, come on, he's a good kid. He watches you all the time. He's just talking, he just likes you. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fair enough then. That's fair enough. Okay. I told, well, I, bet, I told him earlier today, I said, you wish that ATC was your dad, don't you? I didn't know it. That's why I told him. They oh, yeah, idolize you. I know, you know this, I got no, like, he's, really, he's spending more time with you than he does with me. I'm oh, my. Okay, oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just a friendly neighborhood Spider Man. She's not my girlfriend! I am not your friend? Uh... It was. Before I found out you had to my boyfriend.
All right, everyone is now back from breakouts. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I said it yesterday, I'll say it today. Um, the group discussions were great. I can't wait to hear um, the report outs. So I will start. I'll only call the person's um, name that I know is in that group and then they can identify who their reporter was. They may or may not be the reporter. Um, I, Bianca, do you want to start with our group? Do you mind being the reporter for our group? Oh, there we go. Now I'm off of mute. I have not distilled out what our key points are. So I'm going to on the fly skim my notes and try to distill out key points. And then you all will have to help me out. Um, Absolutely. And I have to say, this was amazing discussion. I came into the groups feeling like I had no answers to any of the questions and was really happy to learn from everybody else in the groups and, and engage in the discussion. Um, in terms of critical technology hurdles, um, we had quite a bit of discussion on kind of how to, how to scale up, how to get from what's been proven in the lab to actually deploying it and the need to deploy so that we could get to lessons learned from that. Um, the need for small local startup industries rather than necessarily going straight to really big facilities because smaller ones may be easier to start. Um, just the, the capital cost of a small plant is, is much lower. Um, let's see, skimming through here. Uh, the farmer really needs to be involved, informed as a customer needs to know that there's uniformity in the product, that there's availability of the product, that they can get paid for carbon, that they're sequestering with this. Um, and there needs to be some uniformity in the recommendations. Um, so that was sort of more on the use end. Uh, but in terms of the technology, I think you know, there's, there's a lot to be done. Probably some other groups will have more to add there. Um, and I may have not done that one justice. Critical policy hurdles. PR, PR image was a big piece that we talked about. Um, we, we talked about sort of how in some states biomass has gotten a bad rap or the application of various biomass and in, including you know, various products that get put on land. Then later it turns out that there's heavy metals, right? There are those kinds of concerns. Um, really getting to the local level and educating policymakers on the science-based uh, information that we have available right now so that we have that scientific integrity, but distilling that down so that the messages are easily graspable by somebody who doesn't have any background in biochar. Uh, that is a key hurdle. Um, there was a lot of discussion on biomass energy and how there used to be a lot more of an effort on biomass. And recently the effort has been more on agrivoltaics, solar systems, wind energy, uh, anaerobic digesters. And there's kind of a need for a comparison and also a layering of multiple of these in one place. Like for example, if we could have biochar applied in a place that also has solar or that also has wind, or that's also using anaerobic digestion, um, bringing all of these together and then, and then uh, really pushing on the carbon credits. Um, carbon credits definitely came back multiple times throughout the discussion. Um, we had Chris from Rural Development with us who shared with us that there are a lot of opportunities with RD for both grants for small facilities and for loan guarantees for larger facilities. So definitely a lot of opportunities with, um, with RD to get some of these funded opportunities in DOE um, and several others. Uh, see we discussed the need to distill some policy recommendations out of this forum so anyone who works in the policy space um, we need to understand what some of the gaps are where we can really push to make an impact and that's one role that aft can contribute to amongst any others that do that kind of work here in this space um, we can really uh, help educate both at the federal and the local levels with policymakers so that they understand that biochar is possible 
is carbon negative if you do it right, especially when it's a byproduct of, for example, sustainable aviation fuel production and that kind of thing. Um, could really make a lot of impact there with, with distilling those messages out. Let's see, some private industry roles in investing. Again, carbon markets came up. They came up over and over. There's really a key need for that to be a part of the picture. Um, producers right now can't very well get loans and don't have an ability to really get credits, get investors and banks to the board, to the, to the table, but when they can sell carbon credits, um, that, that picture changes. Let's see here. I feel like we had some additional pieces in the, in the private industry role beyond carbon markets, um, but a lot of private industry is really looking to uh, get their emissions to zero or the entire supply chain to zero. They're willing to pay for climate smart commodities. They're willing to pay for the carbon, uh, carbon credits that get sequestered on land. Um, so that's a, a really key opportunity for, for bringing those in. Also, there are standards available for biochar right now in Europe and internationally. North America does not have standards yet. Tom Miles has excellent resources on where we're at with that. Um, but there are standards to make sure that biochar is safe and stable and sustainable. And we can pull on those standards to create standards for biochar um, as well as ways to easily analyze the quality of the biochar and that'll really help move things forward. Um, finally, I'll go over some insights. The last question was, what are the changes to yesterday's conclusions? We heard a lot of amplification and a lot of really interesting new pieces of information. Um, we talked a bit about how the potential offered by co-products through creating sustainable aviation fuels, that's a really exciting opportunity. It's not something that I had thought of before until I, I came to this convening and started to learn that there are those opportunities. So those are really exciting. Um, the potential of having community-based, smaller scale uh, production facilities is a really great one. Um, there's a lot of federal funding out there in the space right now and a lot of potential synergies that can be aligned and that we probably need to work on aligning better. And thinking about systems and really integrating biochar into soil health management systems, climate smart systems, regenerative systems, rather than having it be its own thing. The potential to layer all these practices and build up carbon, you know, whether it's layering cover crops and biochar and no-till and crop rotation and grazing, or then even potentially layering on top of that wind energy production and anaerobic digesters and solar energy. Um, putting all of them in the same space with biochar, we can really build up the amount of carbon that we can sequester and greenhouse gases we can reduce in any one given space. And we need that because our farmland is limited. Um, let's see. The importance of local policy came up here again. And that's something that I heard both yesterday and today. We really need to educate our local policymakers on the promise of biochar in a way that really shows the scientific integrity of that. We need to, need to be able to provide the resources, but we need to distill the message to one that can be easily grasped by somebody with no background. Um, I think that's it for what I captured. I probably missed something, so I'd be happy for anybody else to chime in. And I just wanna offer that IFT has done a lot of work in the policy space. Um, we we conceived of the conservation title. We put a lot of the farmland protection policy in place in the Farm Bill. There's a lot of work. Every one of our regions has a, a local climate policy manager who interacts with the climate folks and the regenerative ag folks uh, at the local space. There's a lot of impact happening at that level. And so I'd, I'd love to offer up AFT. We can work with this group to create some of that messaging and, and make sure to get it out. I'll end there. Thank you so much for that, Bianca. I was a part of your group. I feel like you covered most, but I'll, I'll see if anyone else from the group has anything to add. You feel like that was comprehensive? Great, thank you. So I think then we'll move on to group 10, which I believe, Harry, you might be the reporter. Yes, that's true. Okay, one. 
um, on the critical technology hurdles, um, our consensus was was that it's it's pretty technically doable already. Um, the issue is more in in developing the markets and uh, developing uh, specifications. One technical aspect that, that came up <clears throat> that we discussed quite a bit was the need and the, the potential for uh, rapid testing so that um, the biochar characteristics could be determined and uh, on site and rather immediately. Um, funding is needed for something like that. And we were, we were tossing around some thoughts and uh, USDA seemed like a, a viable um, avenue to, to underwrite that. Um, and I'm, I'm skipping over um, items that uh, the first group covered adequately. <clears throat> On the uh, policy hurdles, we actually had a lot of discussion on that. Everything kind of goes back to policy in one way or another. Um, <clears throat> there, there's, there's the need for much more interagency uh, collaboration and, and support of the biochar space. Uh, there is some hesitancy within the, the various agencies um, because they have different objectives and mandates, but also I was interested to learn that there are differences in accounting systems that become a significant barrier to collaboration between departments. Um, not sure what we can do about that other than recommend they, they get their acts together. Um, Something that we discussed that wasn't mentioned in the first group that I, I really thought was interesting was that in the, the context of policy, the environmental services are generally valued much lower than the energy uh, derived from biochar. Um, and the, the marketplace is placing, is, is kind of highlighting that in that they're placing a higher value on uh, the carbon dioxide removal than they are on, on just greenhouse gas reductions. Um, so there's an opportunity in the policy space to, to rebalance that um, perspective. Uh, let's see, we, yeah, the, the first group covered uh, rural development's uh, potential as a, as a good funding source for, for commercialization. Um, I'm afraid on the uh, discussion for government uh, technical support, um, my crappy internet cut out and I was not there for most of that discussion. Uh, so if anybody wants to pitch in on that, they can. The, the one item that I, I did catch before I cut out was something we discussed yesterday, was, which was adding uh, biochar to a lot more of the ag research so we can expand the, the portfolio of information there. Looking at in incentives for private commercialization, um, Again, we kind of went back to the policy, the, the government incentives and credits for, for carbon, um, looking at the, the carbon intensity of, of various feedstocks uh, as part of that, that crediting and, and LCA accounting. Um, and then just generally, there's a lot more knowledge that needs to be shared um, or education provided for the, the financial, the insurance uh, sectors so they understand biochar as a product and as a business and uh, in order to make funds a little more free flowing. And I'm afraid 
our discussion was vibrant enough that we didn't even get to the last question. So nobody made a comment about uh, changes in perspective from yesterday. I think we were all just in the process of sharing and learning more. Thank you so much for that, Harry. Does anyone else from Harry's group want to share anything else in particular? All right. Um, so, um, Bev, I'm not sure who was the reporter in your group, but if you let us know, we'd love to hear um, your group's uh, uh, thoughts and, and insights from the discussion. Wait, did we lose Bev? We might have lost Bev. So it's also the group with David Ertle, David Zimmerman, Krista Tripp, Kurt Spokes, Ron Allison, and Steve Thompson. So I wasn't so, sure who the out was for that group. Yeah, uh, my, Kurt will take care of that. Oh, thank you. So I'll just add the things that we haven't heard yet. Um, one of the items that came up in the critical technology hurdle was uh, mobile technologies should be emphasized too. Um, the critical policy hurdles, primarily the carbon market that everyone's been echoing, as well as incentives to promote biochar use. Um, and the USDA federal side, we brought up that the US EPA should also be an important player in this, mm -hmm. that they're gonna be involved in terms of the air emissions. Um, the major incentivized program that we think would go far away is development of pilot plants and demonstration plants, because success stories will travel a far way in this sector. And in terms of the presentation discussion, the change and inclusions from yesterday, no, it just primarily in the terms of from Chris and Tripp solidified the ideas that came about from yesterday into the discussions today. All right, thank you. And it looks like David Lard, you're the last group. I don't know if you're the reporter again today, or you can just let us know who was. Joe Pollins, the uh, reporter. Ah, thank you. Uh, Joe, uh, engineer with Frontline Bioenergy. Uh, with respect to the first question, critical technology hurdles, we basically talked about how it's a matter of scale, uh, but not every system needs to be a very large system, but more about having uh, enough smaller regional systems, not necessarily on the farm, but locally available at the county level, uh, which would also help with the variability of biochar production. You know, if more people were bringing it to a centralized spot, then hopefully it would be more consistent in operating conditions and or feedstock acceptable acceptability. Uh, we talked about how it could be scaled up tomorrow with the necessary investment. Uh, but one of the challenges is aligning investment timetables with technology advancement timetables. Um, kind of pairing that together and coupling that is challenging. Specifically, we talked about um, pyrolysis technologies for SAF. You know, we heard a lot about SAF this afternoon. Uh, and there's a lot of technology hurdles that are still uh, trying to get from pyrolysis intermediates to finished products. Uh, a lot of the hydro treating uh, bulk upgrading of bio oil, uh, you know, fractional cuts from the process and using them for different fuel range compounds, you know, whichever market you're going after, the properties that are desirable. Uh, utilizing the bio oil heavy cut for SAF production would also assist conventional SAF production, uh, you know, because we talked about the limitations of just using one uh, supply feedstock like vegetable oil. Uh, in terms of policy, we did talk about carbon credits as well. I'll just go to the things that were kind of a little bit different. Uh, we had talked about how the USDA NRCS identified crop residues as an exclusion within its policy for biochar production, uh, which seems very counterintuitive. And then we also, uh, because corn stover re residues need to remain on the field, you know, why wasn't that a consideration for uh, cellulosic ethanol when that was being ramped up in terms of production? And also, 
Minnesota and New York state policymakers excluded pyrolysis from proposals due to arbitrary limitations, mainly because they needed to have guardrails on their legislation proposals. And so they had to put in something. And so they excluded pyrolysis. Uh, and so maybe it's just not getting enough information correctly conveyed to those um, making decisions. For DOE and USDA, uh, you know, we kind of talked about how biochar combustion has been the focus for a lot of pyrolysis uh, technologies in order to get heat back in the reactor, but that also reduces the availability of minerals going back to the land under high temperature thermal conversion. Uh, we also talked about how the DOE uh, doesn't seem to appreciate the non-energy benefits, whereas the USDA seems to appreciate uh, the non-energy benefits. Uh, the USDA, um, our group kind of outlined how they need to help farmers identify the right biochar for their respective soil type. This could be something that would really help out farm farmers at the, the lower levels and, and uh, you know, be more specific to them, could create a little bit more of that human connection. Uh, the incentive won't really come from boosted crop yields, but it will come from carbon sequestration efforts is one of the things that we kind of surmised. Uh, in terms of incentivizing private industry, we did talk about how it is tough to manage biomass uh, orchards in California. There's a lot of biomass just open pit burning, um, being able to you know, just turn over that crop. Uh, also the, the, I'll call it the, the surface level understanding that feedstock suppliers will not necessarily want to buy back the biochar after they initially provided the biomass for said conversion. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of bad optics there. But then we also talked about how it's that therein lies the opportunity for feedstock suppliers to become investors in the bioenergy technologies. So that the way there's more stakeholders present and that all the stakeholders are receiving the benefits of the industry growth. Uh, we also talked about in, Ice, in Iceland, how uh, there's already direct air capture um, and it has a relatively high cost, 600 to $800 per CO2 uh, ton equivalent. And that already seems acceptable for companies that already want to reduce their carbon footprint. So if, if they're acceptable to pay for 600 to $800 per ton, you know, why is, why is biochar not getting similar you know, paid for cost? Uh, and we talked about going direct uh, for carbon reducers in order to supply them with carbon credits, uh, kind of take out some of the middlemen in terms of carbon markets. But that really also relies on good publicity and outreach, which is challenging in order to be successful. We also talked about how there's lots of small manufacturers for biochar in the wild, wild, west, the wild, wild west nature of biochar production and increased local pollution, which could then damage the reputation of biochar as a whole. So there needs to be a little bit of accountability for that. Then we did also talk about the carbon removal X Prize competition uh, and how more competitions like that will spur more investments efforts to incentivize private industries to focus more on carbon. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you know, presentations and discussion today, if they change anything. If, if anything, the discussions have kind of made biochar as a solution more sobering, mainly because there's a lot of challenges left. We got policy, technical markets, local level, regional level, energy, agronomic, and these are all widely differentiated, which makes them very difficult to tackle simultaneously. Okay. So more people need to be in the game. Thank you so much for that, Joe. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, we're recording all of this, and we also are asking um, each of the reporters to share their notes. So if there's something that you didn't capture, because I was furiously taking notes, and I know I didn't capture everything, there are a couple of opportunities for you to obtain that. We had fewer groups um, to report out, 
Um, and so we got through this session a little quicker, which is never a problem in a four hour meeting. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanna reiterate um, our next step. So as I indicated, the planning group, as well as whoever else we may recruit, which will likely be all of you, <laughs> will be um, publishing comments and executive summary and trying to kind of synthesize all of this rich conversation and then actually come up with some actionable next steps, right? Because I think a lot of conversation in this group over the last couple of days around how we can continue to engage with each other, work with each other, enlist a lot of the support that was listed in this room. Um, I think AFT being a, a great like center space of that support and thinking about ways in which we can continue the conversation, continue to uh, synthesize more information and share it, and then start to really come up with concrete plans to move forward. Um, for those that don't know me, I love I love conversation, but I love action more. And I think that um, uh, the planning committee is very much in the same vein. So we want to see something come from this conversation more than just a report. We want to see continued engagement and interaction with each other. So that is what we hope to accomplish as one of the outcomes of this conversation. And then I would imagine a number of side conversations that will grow from this discussion and continued engagement with our federal partners and our non-federal partners, our industry partners. So just be on the lookout for a number of additional invitations to continued engagement. The recording of this event will be available on our website, and then I'll turn it over to Bianca to share AFT's development of some additional um, early development, yes, but potentially a great source of information for all the things we talked about today. Yeah, in terms of that, Lakeisha, we have, uh, we have some funding from NRCS now. Thank you very much from NRCS. It's not quite obligated yet, so we're at the very beginning, but we will be working to pull together resources that are available on our Farmland Information Center site at American Farmland Trust. And so that will include the webinars we'll put together, the conversations on biochar that we will put together. Um, there will be links to the National Biochar Tool once that's available through ARS and all the folks who, are, who will be collaborating on that. There'll be links to USBI. There will be the kind of documentation like what we're coming up with during this workshop here really kind of pulling together those key talking points to a policymaker in a certain space uh, that they may need to be able to help us get biochar to scale. So hoping to pull all that together. Uh, we're just one partner in it all. Hope to work across all of the organizations here and get everybody together around this. It's really exciting to be able to be part of it. Thank you so much. And I think our last slide is just um, gratitude, right? Thank you so much to the planning committee. I can't thank them enough, but more than that, thank you for all the attendees. I don't, we know that this would not have been as exciting and rich a discussion if y'all had not come forward and been so generous with your thoughts, your experience, your knowledge. Um, and so just thank you to everyone who took the time to attend, everyone that took the time to speak and everyone that took the time to help us plan and sponsor. Um, and again, special thank you to NCAT and AFT for helping us to sponsor this virtual event. And hopefully the net will have additional conversations and perhaps maybe even in person. Um, so I'd love to turn it over to any of the convening planning committee for final thoughts, uh, observations or comments. I just want to echo uh, Keisha's thank you to everyone. It's been, uh, I think, an excellent discussion. I've learned a lot, um, and I wouldn't have learned nearly as much without all of you. So I appreciate your participation and hope we can uh, be in touch in the future. Absolutely. Lakeisha, I want to echo that as well. I want to thank everyone. Uh, I also want to remind. Uh, everyone that uh, the white paper is uh, probably the next step. And, and so please uh, respond to our emails and, and our opportunity uh, to be further involved in, in, in synthesizing our conversations and moving towards those next steps. And, and so thanks to the participants and special thanks to, uh, well, FAR, uh, NCAT and, and AFT. So thank you. Thank you. Any final thoughts, Beth? Okay. I feel like she's saying we said it all. <laughs>
<laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all for all your time. The recording will be available. You don't have to do anything extra. We will email everyone that registered a copy of the recording, a link to the landing page that FAR will have to temporarily house everything. And then once AFT's website is up, we'll either refer directly to that or move all this information over there. Um, but the information will be kept for all of posterity. And then additional information about the white paper, request for input, request for comment will also come. There's nothing you need to do. We have your emails now. You can never escape us. We will just keep contacting you and asking you for things. So um, thank you all so much. And I'm so excited to be able to give you back half an hour of your day. Um, thank you so much again. And uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.